Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Bomber here. Very excited today to be joined by Miriam Plotinsky. She is the author of a really interesting book that I just read called Teach More, Hover Less. She also writes for Edutopia. She's been doing lots of interesting stuff, talking about teaching, teacher education, thinking about developing folks and equipping teachers with the tools they need to be more effective, uh, as indicated by the great title, Teach More, Hover Less. Miriam, welcome to Trending in Education. Hi, thanks for having me. It's wonderful that you're here. I have enjoyed getting through the book. The book also has nice worksheets and reflection <laughs> questions. It made me reflect on my thinking. Before we get into the book, though, we always like to start with our guests' origin stories. What got you to this point in your professional life? How did you get to this point in your career? I have been in education now for 22 years. I did not really intend to be a teacher ever. That was not in my life plan. I had the urge on a whim my sophomore year in college to check it out. I don't know why I walked by this like orientation flyer for the College of Education and thought, okay, that might be, that might be fun, which is so bizarre because I also remember having the conscious thought in high school, who would ever do this? What person would ever do this to themselves every day? And, you know, as a student also, at least through middle school, I was pretty unsuccessful. So I had that perspective of I'm not doing well in this setting and I never want to be at a school again. And that did change. And I became a teacher and my original intention was really to teach for a limited time. I wanted to have the experience, but then my big plan was I was going to get a graduate degree, which I did in education policy. I was living in D.C. at the time. I'm still in that area. And everyone in D.C., you know, you're heading toward Capitol Hill, you're heading yeah. toward, in my case, education reform. And I was really very upset when I learned that the people who usually create education policy are not the people who have ever been educators. So, you know, I wanted to change that. What happened a few years into teaching is that it kind of hooked me in a way I did not <laughs> expect. I really, I really started to love it. And I didn't want to leave. I was in a great place. I was in a great school. And I loved being with the kids. They made me laugh every single day. They were unpredictable and, and just delightful. So that was where I stayed for a very long time, just cementing classroom practice. Yeah. And, you know, I suppose partway into my teaching career, and I can talk about this more where we discussed the book, I really also started to question a lot of what I was doing yeah. because I was very controlling in ways that I thought I had to be that were modeled for me and to me my whole life. And then I started doing something different and, and it, it, it really changed the way I see teaching. And then about five years ago, I had already transitioned to school leadership. I was a department chair. I was a past professional development person. Yeah, I became what's called an instructional specialist, which means I now work with a very large number of schools, uh, helping them with whatever they need. And I write. Right. I know, I know like. You stay busy and among those things are books and teach more, hover less is your most recent title. There are others in your bibliography. So I teach more of my first official published book, which is awesome. And then I've got Lead Like a Teacher, same publisher, Norton, coming out in March of 2023. It's about how you lead your school from a teacher perspective. Like, nice. So basically you're taking what I call the empathy gap, which is when teachers and administrators don't really see eye to eye, fairly common, and you're trying to close that up and create a more productive environment. So that's what book number two is about. Awesome. Book number three is in the works. It's about building student identity. The, the title is still in flux, which is what happens. I make a title and sometimes the title changes, but I'll keep you posted on that one. Awesome. One is out, one is pending, and then a third one is on the way. So that's that's impressive. And then the other place I've seen you write is Edutopia and other things we can find through your Twitter handle. Your Twitter handle is? At M-I-R-P-L-O-M-C-P-S. Awesome. And we'll include all of that in the show notes. But then let's get into this book in particular, because I do think it's relevant. And for me, it resonated at, certainly as a parent and then also as someone who's read up and had some conversations with folks about how to manage more effectively. There has been an awakening in several places, I think, where micromanaging and hovering and helicoptering is not good. How do we curb that from our lives? And you were very reflective of that in the book and even in your open here about how you thought about that as a teacher. Can you talk about what led you to write this book? 
Yeah, it was really sometimes one class can make a difference. And I was teaching a creative writing class and it was an experience where there was no set curriculum and I had to create it. And when I tried to handle too much of the writing, kids sign up for a class like that. It's an elective. They don't have to take it. They're taking it because they love to write. And I would say, you know, why don't we write this horror story you know, around Halloween? Let's be fun. And then a kid would come to me and say, well, I, I'm not really comfortable with writing a horror story. I'm working on a book. I read a chapter of this book and turned it to you. And I was like, why would I say no to that? You're writing a chapter of something. And I started finding ways to say yes, mm -hmm. essentially. Now, caveat here, that's a class without a curriculum. You can still do this method with classes that are more prescribed, but it's not about always letting kids do whatever they want. That's a misconception about hover free teaching. It's about finding opportunities for them to do it where it's possible. Mm -hmm. Where can you step back and where, where do they have expertise? Yeah, exactly. And building that sense of student agency, and it's all built on a foundation of trust. To me, this resonates most with my parenting mindset where the things that I'm trying not to do yeah. are some of my instincts to get maybe more controlling and more, I again, I, full disclosure, I let you know, I have a three-year-old at home, so I'm at a point where hovering is definitely not working. So I need <laughs> to explore other opportunities, but any thoughts on the parallels between what works in a classroom, what might work with your kids at home and what might also work in a boardroom? Well, I'm going to be vulnerable first because last night I was standing behind my 14 year old while he was, according to him, doing homework on the computer. And I was trying to assess whether or not he was actually doing homework yeah. or whether he was, uh, you know, video gaming. Yes. And, you know, he said, he got very agitated. And when I said, you know, I'm just trying to see, he said, I don't like people behind me looking over my shoulder, which of course I understand. I was hovering yeah. and I had a reason to do that as a parent. And my reasons for doing that, there's an emotional connection there. And I'm not saying we're not connected as teachers, but there's an emotional component to parenting that makes it harder for us to use those same strategies. Like I can help a kid who I'm teaching through something that they might not have so much patience for my own child. So there's right. separation. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, one thing I like to say is, you know, no one has ever wanted to be micromanaged. No one has ever said, I really appreciate it when someone doesn't trust me and therefore looks at every single thing I'm doing. Yeah. And that extends from children you're raising. You know, if you push too hard, they will withdraw. They will find ways to push you away. They're very effective with that. Kids will do the same thing. You won't actually know what they're learning. It's strange. You think the more you control, the more they learn. It's just the more you're hearing your own voice and less of theirs, which gives you less data about them. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, in the boardroom, how many adults have left jobs because their boss didn't know when to stop pressuring them? about things that they were perfectly competent to do themselves. We're seeing this in the, actually the headline, the remote work conundrum. Yeah. People are being asked to come back to office spaces and there's a certain implication that for the past three-ish years, whatever they've been doing at home hasn't been effective enough. Right. Now, for a percentage of the workforce, that might be true, but probably for the majority of people, they've been doing a good job. So when someone says, I need to be with you and see you, is that really a valid argument? I understand the whole collegiality thing and you want to be in the same space. But it's not the same world it was three years ago. And it's a world that's asking people who are in charge to hover less. Right. Because in, in that case, and, and another contrast perhaps with your kids, is that hopefully that foundation of trust is already there. But with an employee or with a student who you're just meeting, you have to reestablish that trust with every new student you encounter. And in, in many cases, just like with parenting, there's a constant testing of are you okay? Is this someone I can trust? Is this someone who's going to allow me to really grow? And then also there's some really great examples of when you ask for the right answer and a student who may be a little shy and tentative offers something that's not right. You had an example of the lion eating another animal as an example of a parasite. I thought that example really got at the importance of of building trust and being less about what is right or wrong versus did I take this opportunity to actually build that relationship, build that trust with someone who is really maybe on the fence. It's really about how we validate a child as a learner in our classroom. And I also just wrote a piece about this. Uh, what happens is that when we call on a child as a teacher, we're often looking for one answer 
or a specific set of answers. And if we don't hear it, we'll turn to the next child and just keep going until we get to the point that we think we need to be at. But for me, it's about uncovering a mistake to lead to learning or, you know, a different kind of thinking. When in, in the example of the book, they were trying to look for, I believe, a symbiotic relationship. And the student was confused and talked about parasitic relationships versus symbiotic relationships. She got it wrong. And I had the first scenario which the teacher said, uh, not quite, let's keep going and picks a different kid. And then the second example, the teacher said, well, let's talk a little bit more about that and why you're thinking that, you know, what's going through your mind. Or sometimes you can provide, I provide suggestions. There's a turn and talk opportunity or even the word, okay, okay. So uh, who else wants to say something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because then the kid's just going to sit back and think, I messed up. And for some kids, that's not a problem. Some kids are happy taking the risk no matter what. They put themselves out there. They try again. But for a lot of kids, that's a cue I don't need to speak up again. Right. Maybe for a little while, maybe not ever. So that trusting relationship is this person appreciates my ideas and how they get me somewhere. So... If I'm supposed to be talking about a symbiotic relationship and I'm talking about a parasite instead and it's the wrong thing and I'm saying, okay, when we talk about what head lice does to you, what's the process and how are we thinking that symbiotic? What's the lice doing for the person? What's the person doing for the lice? Yeah. And then you can start to work through it and it's not a wrong answer anymore. It's a learning opportunity. So your idea uncovers something. Your idea uncovers something that we need to know. Yeah. And it's also, you're signaling to the group, this is how I react to people who put themselves out there. So there's also, you know, a chilling effect if you're too abrupt with the one kid who's tentative then the other five or six shy kids in class or kids who are struggling, they all pick up on that. It, to me, it does connect to the term that I'm already tired of around quiet quitting, but that is, we're a trend spotting show. So we do notice, duly noted, there's a trend out there about quiet quitting. It's getting a lot of pickup, but it does feel like it's touching on a lack of engagement and an engagement problem that existed prior to recent years, but it's certainly manifesting itself again today. Arguably, many teachers are, are faced with those kinds of engagement problems themselves, yeah. let alone have the energy to then get that engagement out of their students. How are you tackling that? You know, I, I felt like the book was written with kind of a post-pandemic sensibility around it's tough being a teacher. You only have so much time. It's it's very concise and actionable with real like work examples and things you could actually use in your classroom today. What's your take on the hearts and minds of educators now heading into the new school year here in 2022? So for me, quiet quitting is a really trendy way to stay burnout. Yeah. It just means that you have, as you say, you've mentally disengaged because you're protecting yourself. Yeah. And, you know, we talk a lot about teacher burnout, which is very real. We don't talk enough about student burnout, mm -hmm. which is also very real. And that's what happens when kids, as you say, you've got few kids in the classroom who may have been mislabeled quiet or disengaged and really they're perceiving a risky situation. They don't feel safe in that space and therefore they do not want to, they don't want to go any further with it. For adults, you know, teaching is so complex and it's so challenging and it doesn't help that the american public and the media you know they might be reporting on teacher burnout and teacher shortages and oh it's such a shame but then we get a very different message through a lot of what we hear about you know laziness and easy day easy year and someone responded to something i saw on twitter last night was the main night teachers are taking off points from kids for this let's let's, let's dock their sick days why are you trying to be punitive yeah. for people who are working for your children? I don't understand. The idea behind it, the teachers who are the most successful are the ones who typically narrow their focus and focus to the kids, what the kids need to know and be able to do. And I understand there's so much noise out there and so much paperwork and so much other stuff that can be really hard to do. So I'm not saying it's easy. But when I wrote the book, I remember talking to a teacher who said, I've never read an education book that I've been able to apply to anything. And I'm hoping that's not the experience of a lot of teachers, but that's what led me to try and make sure the book was really very packed with strategies and ideas and tools that you can adapt as opposed to, here's just a lot of thoughts. <laughs> right. Because right now people are reaching out for help, but they need help on their terms, not on ours. When we enact professional development or we try to go in and help teachers, there's not that, what do you need enough? And so my idea is if you could 
pick this up and even you don't have to read the whole book. You don't have to read the four stages of what it takes to be a hands-off teacher. All you have to do is literally zero in on one thing that makes sense to you and try it and adapt it. And then maybe your day will be a little bit easier. I would not presume to tell somebody how to fix their burnout. Right. Well, and then at the same time, you know, the idea of being hands-off, like even some of the language that you, you're you using is almost counterintuitive where people think, oh, I want to be hands-on. I want to signal that I'm I'm doing more. It's almost like a myth of teacher agency where the teacher doing things is pulling the strings and, you know, in some ways they're the puppet master and if they can make the room move, they'll do it. But if they're not there, the room doesn't go. You know, you kind of get into that with some interesting examples. You know, what, what we're talking about also is a total change in perspective. You're not teaching different content. You're not doing less or more necessarily on the back end of planning. It's more, what do you think teaching is? Is teaching filling kids with information? Or is it about something else? How do we really measure whether a kid knows something? So when we look at what it looks like in the classroom, it means that you are taking opportunities where you can to give kids some choice that they might not otherwise have had. And you're doing that in one very simple strategy, which I don't talk about much because I wanted to get something more actionable, is just wondering how much you talk. You know, it's amazing what happens when we don't speak as much. If I put a quotation on the board or an idea and I stand back and say, I'm going to be quiet for five minutes and listen to everyone share a thought or write a thought on a post-it note and put them back and walk around. There are ways that kids can share their ideas that are less less of a risk and you know, non-vocal or even however you want to structure it. But it's really about thinking, how do I uncover what kids already know? So when I think about planning lessons, for example, I want to ask some questions before I finalize my lesson plans. Have you learned about this before? Does this term bring up any knowledge for you already? And then, you know, what have I done in the past that's working? What's not? I was just before we, we met for this conversation, I was working on a class I'm teaching next week to adult learners. And I'm working on my feedback on feedback slide where I asked three questions. What worked? What would you suggest to make the learning better? And what are your lingering questions? And then the next class, I put them up there and I respond to every single one. Mm. And I say, today, as a result of what you told me, here's what we're going to try. Also, here's what we can't try. For example, I've had a lot of pushback about some tangents in my class. And some tangents are granted not good. But some, I believe, lead to learning the more we let people talk and work through things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold firm on that one. Yeah. But I'm going to explain why. And I think that's the other aspect of it where you're intentionally hands-off as opposed to checked out. There's a distinction there oh. where you're... You're actually just seeing what happens if I don't talk right now. What happens if I don't get into almost the command and control dynamic? You know, a lot of, mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about classroom management and school safety and like all that stuff is very much front and center. Lots of times, not to mention all the COVID protocols, it's been very much of a controlled environment, but that's where I found your perspective to be really refreshing and in, in a lot of ways needed where what happens if you just almost just wait a moment and slow your instinct to intervene and to be the, the, the visible leader and tap into more quiet, subtler arts. I found that to be really interesting. Well, and you know, I, I appreciate that because one thing that I always think is a problem is that we feel as though the quicker we react to something, the better we're doing. We have this strange correlation between speed and effectiveness. And I see it in children too. The one who gets it first wins. Yeah. Oh, but we're teaching people this. And it's so kind of productive. For example, our national literacy and math data just came out a couple of days ago and people are understandably not thrilled about it. And they're immediately figuring out, you know, what does it mean? And what do I do? And how do I move forward? Right. And my whole piece with that is just be intentional for a little bit and think about what it means because we have missing data. And we also have circumstances that are evolving. And let's figure out what we're looking at. So if a kid's not achieving in literacy, is there a pattern? Is there a skill or set of standards that they're particularly struggling with that we can really put our efforts toward? Let's get some information. Let's think about it. And I'm not saying we have all day. We don't have all day. But we also don't need to do it right now because urgency doesn't have to be a speed thing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it reminds me of the rush to be the first in the chat. And, you know, I've seen a lot of bad webinars are sort of that open-ended question. First person answer gets the reinforcement. 
everyone else types the same thing into the chat to show that they're also right. But it is that idea of mm -hmm. rather than struggling, you know, the kid who actually learns is the one who had it a little bit wrong and then had to accommodate, assimilate their frameworks, adjust their thinking to actually achieve some kind of meaningful growth and breakthrough. And then I also was struck by the level to which you're thinking about this through the lens of someone who's been there, but you're also trying to present almost like a mentor or a coach. How do you think about your persona, the voice in the book, and maybe it's building on your experience as someone who's done a lot of different types of teacher training. How do you see your role and how in some ways are you using the same techniques as you're espousing in the book? I like to think of it as humble partnership. I know that we like to use the word expert, but if the, this pandemic has taught me anything, it's that the whole concept of expertise is flawed. You know, we see leaders and people who are way up there pausing and not knowing what to do mm. and making a lot of decisions that seem illogical or wrong. And no matter how long I've been teaching, no matter how many classes I've taught, I haven't taught the same classes that you taught or the same kids you taught. I also don't have your experiences and I don't know your story. And I don't want to presume that I can write it for you or that I understand what you're going through because empathy is tricky like that. So when I come to a proper teacher, I really come at it with no one's ever fully got it. We're all still figuring it out. I am one of those people. I make mistakes. Please correct me and please tell me how I can help you. I mean, I was, I was teaching a class. This was so ironic on growth mindset. And I made an off comment about my math expertise because my background's ELA. And one of the teachers walked up to me after the class and said, you really shouldn't do that. You know, because how would you feel if I said, I really don't read very well, or I don't, it's, oh my God, you're right. So the next class I said, call me on it, hold me accountable. Mm. And I feel that way when I work with teachers too, because they know, and I want the book that I write or any book I write or any article that I write to reflect that respect and that, that humility for the journey we have. And the only time I ever get angry with an educator is when they express how much they've got it or how much they know. I don't really understand that at all. Yeah. It's hubris, Miriam. Pride, hubris. Go, pride, pride goeth before a fall. Be careful. And I know that. I've taught literature for a long time. They always go down. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thanks for a good narrative, though. We're getting closer to time. As we're thinking about the future, which is one of the things we do here, we also try to spot trends. What are you seeing on the horizon? How do you see this stuff playing out? While I love what you're putting out here, the flip side is... Teachers don't have a lot of time already. They're under a lot of pressure. There's going to be increased pressure around the results you just described, quote unquote, learning loss. It's going to lead to, let's get more, let's get the scores going in the direction we need them to go. Let's get more tutoring and other interventions. Let's see how they move the needle. At the same time, I think what you're talking about is almost a, a paradigm shift around how we think about developing teachers. How do you see those two things playing forward? What do you see on the horizon? First of all, I should tell you that I'm very trend resistant. And what that means is that I feel as though nothing is more effective or powerful than good first instruction. Mm -hmm. If we can really focus on excellent instruction and being open to new kinds of instruction, you know, the trends are the trends. You know, maybe we could argue that a couple of years ago in virtual learning, Nearpods and Paradex, and you could look at that as a trend. There's an increase in digital tools, increase in online applications. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. But did it help you become a better teacher? And did you take what you learned? And are you still implementing it in your practice? And are you still applying it? So when you do all those near pods or near dexter surveys or what have you, cahoots, everyone loves a cahoot. When you do that, are you using it to learn about what kids know and need to be able to do? Or are you just having, oh, wait, this is a cool application I can try. One thing I noticed, and I also learned this during the pandemic from my own children, is the teachers who were the most successful on Zoom or in hybrid situations, very challenging circumstances were the ones whose practice was already strong. They were in a learning space. They wanted to see how they could be better. And they didn't have the bells and whistles going on a lot of the time. Yep. A lot of the time they were just doing, you know, they, they were, but they were checking on every kid. They were tuned into every kid and what that kid needed. And instead of panicking about what they didn't know or trying for interventions after something didn't work and the reteaching and the let's make it up, Let's make sure I've got it right the first time. Let's work, make sure I'm formatively assessing them consistently. I know these kids and I know what they can do. And I know how to fix it before it becomes a problem. Right. 
So at the risk of sounding a little bit curmudgeonly, what I would say is be a trend. <laughs> be trader than you are as a teacher while still pursuing how you can best serve the kids in front of you. Yeah, and to me, that connects to things that may even be deeper movements, perhaps, rather than trends, where one of them that I talk a lot about on the show is social emotional learning and understanding the whole child and being trauma informed and be really just being empathetic and showing some grace. That seems implicit and in some cases even explicit in the stuff that I'm picking up from you. What are your thoughts uh, on that front? It all, in some ways, I would view your book in part as an argument for allowing the space for that type of engagement to happen while still being true to whatever your curricular objectives might be. But, but I'd love to hear more of your thinking on all this. What I try to do in my teaching and in my methods is more of an embedded approach for student wellness. It's not an area of expertise that I have, and so I'm very aware of that. Amazing school counselors who really have a lot of knowledge and a lot of lots to contribute on that, we can learn from. I know that a lot of school districts are using a separate SEL curriculum right now to help kids out in the wake of what's happened. For me, it's about being aware of the kids and aware of what they're going through and also not making assumptions. Kids walk into a child walks into a classroom late and a teacher says, I'm nice to see you. That sarcasm or yeah. that implication. We should always be happy to see a child. And we don't know why they walked in late, but they're there now. What was happening to them last night? Were they taking care of a sibling or a sick relative? Were they working? Were they so for us as instructors whose expertise doesn't necessarily fall into SEL? Can we please recognize the humanity of the children that we work with and that just like us, they're going through things. That's why I get really annoyed about attaching consequences to behavior. Like, for example, my children's school announced that this is, whether an absence is excused or unexcused, once you miss 10 days, we're going to dock your overall grade by a percentage point. Hmm. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, how does the grade that's supposed to be a reflection of learning outcomes connect to whether my child is there or not? And we can debate that. We can talk about that all, you know, another episode. But what I'm saying is for us, SEL is in the classroom, recognizing that kids have experiences and lives. And like I said, same about teachers. We don't know their stories. We don't know enough. And we just have to be glad they're there coming to us to learn and accept it for what it is. Because it's not like we're out there handpicking children. We shouldn't be doing that. That's right. not okay. Right. And then... You know, you're someone who's had a long career in education. You've charted your own path to get to where you are. You're now publishing books. You're talking about school leadership roles and ways to maybe think more broadly about a career in education. As we're getting closer to conclusion, I'd love to get some of your perspective, perhaps advice to folks who are in education as a profession. What have you learned so far aside from, you know, pick up a copy of Teach More, Hover Less? What, what other advice would you have for folks who might be thinking about a, a career as a teacher or a career in education? So what I would say first and foremost is find people to accompany you on your journey who can be supportive and who can be positive and who can be solutions oriented. Try to stay out of the negative space. It's really difficult to do. And there's also a place for venting and everyone should have that, but really find the people who are going to be your biggest champions as you go, because this is a hard job, but it's also one of the best jobs that exist. And there's a reason that so many people do continue to teach, even with all the surrounding noise and chaos. And the other thing about it is really trust the kids around you to be partners in your journey as well. They're coming in every day and teachers, I can set this to me once and it blew my mind because it was such a simple idea. She said, teachers have more influence over us than they think. And now that I'm up here and my kids come home and talk about their teachers, I realize it's so true. Teachers hold so much power and kids are looking to them as role models, as leaders, as all kinds of things. So be that stable presence in their lives. You know, one of the reasons that I theorized that things went crazy last year was that when so many teachers going out during the Omicron waves and so forth, that stable presence was suddenly gone and kids yeah. were used to having teachers be stable. Mm -hmm. So just... Acknowledge that when you're going into education, you're going to be that for so many kids and accept that and also be very hyper aware of the fact that they are watching you and that they look to you because you have the power to do so much good. 
Very inspirational words. So folks are walking away from this conversation. Want to give you a chance for some closing thoughts. I would really encourage you that if you are in a space in your teaching career where you're feeling, whatever you want to call it, you're feeling like a quiet quitter, you're feeling that burnout, you're feeling some kind of way, what you should do is think about your next steps and to take a few minutes to breathe. And if any of the ideas about controlling less are appealing, reach out, ask questions. There's a lot about student-centered learning strategies. I'm also always happy to answer questions. I can be reached pretty easily by the website. You can just put stuff in the con comment field. I'm always so happy to talk to teachers about what they're going through and answer questions. So just remember that the community that you have is not just in your school. It's broader than that. And there are a lot of people out there who want to talk to you. Awesome. Fantastic stuff. Miriam Plitinsky, the book is Teach More, Hover Less. And as someone who isn't in a classroom, I haven't been teaching in, in many years now. I would say there's a lot in this that I was reflecting on as a parent whose child is starting to go up through the education system and also as someone who's managed folks and been in a lot of different professional settings. I think you're picking up on broader awakenings around letting go of some of the command and control and allowing it to be a little more of a partnership built on trust and respect. Wonderful stuff. Miriam, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. And hopefully our listeners enjoyed. If you did, please subscribe, write some five-star reviews, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.